It looks like it's live. All right. Good. Thanks. Well, now it's uh, looks like it's 7.01, and I'm going to call this Transportation Policy Board meeting to order on Wednesday, October 12th. Uh, let's get started with some uh, introductions. I'll turn it over to you, Mark. All right. Um, City of Olympia. Good morning, everybody. Danny Madrone with the City of Olympia. Uh, I apologize. I'll need to stay off camera this morning, but I'm here. Yeah. All right. Um, City of Lacey. Um, Andy Ryder, Mayor of Lacey, Senior Chair. City of Tumwater. Um, Peter Agave, President. And City of Rainier. Good morning, everybody. Ron Kemp, City of Rainier. And Tenino. John O'Callaghan, representing the great city of Tenino. And City of Yelm. Uh, this is Brian, Yelm City Council member. And Port of Olympia. Hi, Amy Evans. Good morning. Morning. And um, Renee, business representative. Renee Sinclair, business rep. And David, business representative. Dave Wasson, business representative. And community rep, Michelle. <laughs> Michelle Murray, community rep. <laughs> and um, Travis. Travis Millar, community representative. And Washdot. Ayu Sanoi, Olympic region. And just scanning quickly, that is that's uh, that's it for um, members. And uh, and and a, oh, did I forget someone? I heard someone. Yeah, an inner city transit. I'm Justin Bell, standing in for Don Melnick. Oh, okay. Member. Sorry about that. That's okay. Okay. Oh, and I see um, our emeritus rep has joined as well. Oh, he's still connecting to audio. Uh, our emeritus rep, Pete Kmet. <laughs> okay. And I also want to say, uh, I want to welcome back Katrina Van Every um, from Family Leave. She's been out for a while and she's our, our new transportation manager and she's going to help us with the staff introductions. So Katrina. Good morning. And if I missed anyone, please <clears throat> speak up so I uh, know where I air and can do better next time. But from uh, TRPC, we have Mark, of course, myself, Berlina Lucas, uh, Dorinda Merrill, Allison Osterberg, Dave Reed, uh, Karen Parkhurst, uh, and Aiden Dixon. Uh, and I don't think I see anyone else who's popped in. And then from staff, oh, apparently Paul Brewster is also online. Um, and then from staff from our jurisdictions, we have Ann Freeman Manzanares and Rob LaFontaine from Inner City Transit, Sophie Stimson from the City of Olympia, uh, Matt Unzelman from Thurston County, and Mary Heather Ames from Tumwater. And did I miss anyone else? Hearing none? Um, one, one question, Matt, do you, uh, Matt Unzelman, are you representing the county today? Uh, Commissioner Mejia should be here shortly. Okay. okay. Back to you, Chair. Okay. Well, next up we have um, executive director's reports and announcements. And if anyone's been paying any sort of attention whatsoever this past, uh, especially this past week, um, I think we've all been um, inundated with big time questions about uh, siting of a potential to a runway airport in central. Thurston County. Um, you know, as the policy board, we've sort of been following this a little bit as it's been going along, but I think like most of us, we've sort of been just like, well, you know, Olympia Airport's not going to work, so it can't be there. This whole, it, I just haven't really been taking it that seriously. Um, and then uh, all of a sudden, you know, now we're down to the final three, people are starting to get concerned. And I finally decided to take a look at the map of where they're sort of there's, you know, there's some circle maps out there where they're looking about where it could possibly go. And so one of the first things that I did was I, I took up a city of Lacey map, a zoning map, and said, what, you know, why in the world are they looking at this area? It didn't make any sense whatsoever. And then looking at the zoning map, it, the, the circle went right 
in the exact same area where Joint Base Lewis McCord has all that property off of Rainier Road. And I'm like, oh my goodness, is, is this what they're looking at? And so I, now there's a whole bunch of questions out there. It's like, where exactly do they plan on, on signing this thing if this is the case? Because as we all know, we mean, our, our residents are, are now, you know, at the point now where they're really, really, really concerned, not only about the airport, but are they going to lose their house? And so, Mark, can you? Yeah. <laughs> I, I even asked now Mark to come and give a presentation to the city of Lacey on, on Thursday, and thank you for, for doing that. But I mean, now I feel like we're, we're right in the thick of things now, even though it's, you know, 20 year horizon or whatever, but it's like people are now really, really concerned. So, Mark, can you? Can you give yeah, us an update on yeah, that? Yeah, uh, very quickly. And we'll have this, we'll put have this on the agenda for November to, to have a, a more complete um, update. But one of uh, one of the reasons that this is heated up to the extent that it has is for the first two years that this Commercial Aviation Coordinating Commission convened by the legislature, for the first two years of their work from 2019 till um, August of this year, it was all focused on existing airports and um, expanding existing airports. And uh, Olympia Airport had already been um, excluded from that analysis of expanding existing airports. They then were looking for a a new a site for a new airport. They're calling it a greenfield site for an airport, and no site had been identified until a report came out in mid August 2022, and that is when the two sites in Thurston County were first known to anyone. Um, and and that report will provide the link in the uh, after meeting summary. It's only 55 pages. I, I certainly encourage people to take a look. Um, it that it's all the information that we have right now on uh, on those sites. Um, so then, and there are ten sites in that report, and all of them they looked for a six mile radius, and they're uh, in in uh, in these ten sites. And the the two runway airport would re require. 3,100 acres. And so that's one of the things that I know there's some, some misconception out there. It is not the entire six um, mile radius circle that they would be looking to purchase properties. It's somewhere within that six mile radius, they'd be looking for 3,100 acres um, for a two runway airport. And so um, again, this has this has just been since August. We've been tracking this closely. the The reason this wasn't on your agenda this time is because uh, it was on September twenty third, when we already had done our agenda for this meeting, that that Commercial Aviation Coordinating Commission um, forwarded three sites on for further consideration two sites in Pierce County, in eastern Pierce County, and the one site in central Thurston County. Um, I've been communicating with the, the chair and vice chair of the Commercial Aviation Coordinating Commission. The next steps that they have is working with the FAA to identify what a, a flight path might look like in these areas and a lot of work um, reaching out to the communities and looking at um, the potential environmental impacts, impacts on surface transportation, other infrastructure. They've got a lot of work ahead of them. And so the, 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 this, is a, this is still very early in a process that will take years. The, the, their hope is that they would have a site identified and have an airport um, constructed sometime between 2040 and 2050. And so this is, there is still very much work ahead of them and they will require local permits. They'll require local approvals. They'll, they still need to identify um, an entity to run an airport. They haven't even begun to discuss funding for this airport. This is preliminary work looking at a site. And yet, um, obviously incredibly important to our region when one of those three sites that they're looking at is, is in Thurston County. 
Um, so I think I'll stop there for now and and chair unless you want to have anything else on that for right now. No, I mean, so we, there's still so much up in the air. You know, that's what's so difficult because, the, you know, especially if you live in that area, you know, people are thinking someone's going to come take their home. Um, but, you know, when I when I sent you that map that showed that JBLM property and there's 3,100 acres on that property easily. easily. Um, has that been discussed at all? Have you heard any sort of connection between those two? I, I guess, have I have not. not the what the the consultant did when they were selecting sites was the the main things that they looked at. So I'm sure that the consultant has recognized that because they did one of the considerations was how many parcels, how many different property owners they would need to um uh negotiate with to get the the properties so i my i would wager that was a consideration but you do not you can't find that in the report so i don't know that for for sure at this point but they were also looking at things like the topography um uh is it is it flat enough for an airport the, um are there any obstructions on the way to an airport um what kind of surface transportation is already there is there access to rail um, but these, again, it was a very preliminary sort of of uh, process that they use to identify this. And there just isn't, when you read that 55-page report, there's not a lot of background information at this point. And it's not clear um, uh, how they identified these three sites to move forward. But in I've I've watched all the Commercial Aviation Coordinating Commission meetings, and from their discussion, it's pretty clear that the members of that commission um, feel pretty strongly that the there is a need for service in Southern Puget Sound. There's they've discussed frequently that we've got Payne Field and Snohomish, we've got SeaTac. And there needs to be uh, an airport servicing South Puget Sound. So that's the only kind of intel we have as to why these three sites were moved forward. No. Okay. No. Um, a, a couple of other important updates, if I may. Oh, yeah. oh great. Um, we have uh, the period open for regional transportation plan amendments each year. We open up a, a window looking for um, members to propose amendments to the regional transportation plan. We do expect to, to have a, a request for amendments this year. And so um, in the after meeting summary, we'll provide a, a little more detail on what the timing will be for um, considering those amendments. But um, just so folks know, there, it, it, it will be the first time we'll be bringing that to um, Transportation Policy Board uh, will be the January meeting. So the amendments, the request for amendments are due on November 9th, and then we'll staff will look at those. We'll work with the TAC and we'll be the Technical Advisory Committee, and we'll be bringing those to um, the Transportation Policy Board at the January meeting for first consideration. Also want to mention that our human services transportation plan uh, is out for public review through the end of um, October. This is the document that we update every five years and it is a transportation plan specifically geared towards um, improving the transportation system for people in our community that face challenges um, because of age, income, or ability um, to meet their transportation needs. And so um, we'll also have a link to that in the after meeting summary. I um, encourage you to take a look and provide any input through the end of October. And lastly, I just want to mention, and you'll hear about the Martin Way project more in this agenda, but as part of the um, week without driving in September, um, TRPC, we, uh, with Intercity Transit, we organized a kind of a, a bus uh, tour on Martin Way, where we had one group meet at the downtown uh, transit area, one meet at the um, Lacey Park and Ride, and we met in the middle, taking a look at the Martin Way corridor along the way, and we met for lunch, and it was uh, it was a really nice time to to be able to spend with folks. And our our chair was there, um, Travis Millar was there, 
Jessica McKeegan Jensen. And uh, it was just, it was a great opportunity to, to take a look at the Martin Way project and also to, to participate in that week without driving. And thanks also to Rob LaFontaine at Inner City Transit who uh, joined us on the, on the trip as well. So thank you, Chair, that's all. Thank you. Yeah, boy, um, that was really um, eye-opening. Um, I'm not sure when's the last time everyone's taken the interstate transit, but even I'm glad we're getting to talk about the Martin Way corridor after this because it was one thing that we also realized is, boy, that that corridor, it's the main our main corridor, and it certainly wasn't that easy <laughs> just to get from point A to point B um, along that corridor in a in a timely fashion that you know when we we're all trying to coordinate and, and get together so it, re it really was I mean trying to imagine if that was your only sort if you did not have a vehicle um, how would you get you know it was very very eye-opening and so I, I do encourage everyone to um, you know please go out and take interstate transit um, you know try to plan a day around you didn't have a vehicle um, and, and see what a lot of people in our community um, are up against. It is uh, very eye-opening uh, for sure. So thanks for that. It was fun. It was great to uh, have lunch with everyone too. Okay, with that, um, we're uh, on to our agenda. Uh, can uh, we have a published agenda? Are there any changes? I don't think so. Can I get a motion to approve? So moved. General Callahan. The motion by John. Second. Uh, a second by Danny. <laughs> You. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. Raise your hand. Aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? Then that motion unanimously carries. We have an agenda. And next up is our consent calendar and the approval of our meeting notes from September 14th. Can I get a motion? No approval. General Callahan. Second, Dave Wasson. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on that? Seeing none, all in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. Raise your hand. Aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? Then that motion carries as well. We've approved the consent calendar and the meeting notes from September 14th. So let's go on to our next agenda item, which is the Martin Way check in. Allison and then. I'm really excited about this. <laughs> Good morning, Chair. Um, Allison Osterberg, Senior Planner with Thurston Regional Planning Council. And I'm here with my colleague, Aiden Dixon, to give an update on what's going on with the Martin Way Corridor study. Um, a lot of work has been done. We're in the home stretch for this project and uh, really excited to uh, give an update on where we're at, but also leave some time for the policy board, hopefully to kind of think about some of those next steps because we're at the stage of the process where, where our planning part is done and we're gonna be handing it off to, um, to the jurisdictions to carry forward and to, to do the good work that, that we're identifying is needed. So with that, Aiden, do you wanna pull up the presentation and get it going? Sure. Can everyone see uh, the presentation okay? If you can't, just let me know. Not hearing anything? You're good, Aiden, thanks. Great, excellent. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today, uh, this morning on October 12th. Um, as Allison said, we're here to talk with you a little bit more about the Martin Way Corridor study that we have been uh, engaged with for the past, uh, since 2020, so about over two years now. Uh, like she said, a lot of work has been done, so we're gonna take you through what, what's been done so far and then um, discuss with you about uh, some future plans about wrapping up the project and, and what it might look like in the, in the future. So we'll begin with some background. Uh, we'll move on to the current and future conditions that we've been exploring. Um, next, we'll talk about the preferred alternative that the steering committee uh, agreed upon uh, for what Martin Way uh, should look like uh, moving forward. And then um, we'll talk more about next steps and, and like what I said, uh, what, what the project's gonna look like moving forward and, and how to wrap that up. So the Martin Way Corridor study uh, was a, a partnership project. It wasn't just us working on this, of course. Uh, there were many, many 
uh, organizations and jurisdictions that helped us out uh, to do a lot of work that needed to be done, um, including Thurston County, uh, City of Lacey, uh, City of Olympia, uh, inner city transit, most notably. Um, the purpose of the, the study in general was to develop a, a common vision uh, for the corridor and, and try to kind of ideate around policies to support that vision as the corridor develops into the future. So uh, some general things that we were looking at, uh, safety, uh, bicycle and pedestrian facilities, uh, transit usage on the corridor, land use, uh, you know, access management, things like that. The uh, corridor in and of itself is, is quite long, um, if we've been on it before, uh, so we uh, decided to uh, kind of separate the, its extent into a number of sections, uh, as you can see those here, uh, moving from west to east, uh, City of Olympia on the west, and then City of Lacey in the east. Uh, we felt like this was a better way to kind of get more granular look at what was going on, these kind of individual specific uh, challenges that each section faced and how these all piece together. Our action plan is the result of many different kinds of pieces that all kind of fit into uh, the work that we've been doing. Uh, you can see them all here. Uh, there are a number of them. I won't go through all of them specifically, but uh, just to let you know that uh, a lot of different kinds of data points, uh, perspectives, analysis, all kind of fed into this action plan uh, that are, is currently being created. Everything from uh, surveys to, uh, you know, public engagement opportunities, uh, you know, uh, data analysis, uh, focus groups, open houses, uh, all these things like that. So let's look at Martin Way's past briefly. Um, you know, Martin Way opened in the 1930s as, as part of the state and federal highway system. Uh, it was designed primarily to move cars faster and to provide a, a shorter connection between Olympia and Tacoma. Um, the area was mostly undeveloped, as you can see here. There was lots of trees and streams and, and wetlands primarily. Uh, Martin Way today, uh, I think it's important to understand that um, the the genesis of Martin Way and kind of the raison d'etre, the reason for existence of Martin Way, the, the way that it is used today is very different from the way that it it uh, it was originally created for. We have the expressway now. Um, we don't really need Martin Way to get from Tacoma to Olympia anymore. Um, there's a lot more development on the corridor now. It's home to over 9,000 residents, uh, 11,000 jobs, uh, sees over 40,000 vehicle trips a day, um, and 25% of daily transit riders. Uh, I think it also is important to note that um, Martin Way is the most important corridor for inner city transit service. Uh, it sees a vast majority of its boardings and, and departures or um, it sees a lot of, of transit traffic on the corridor. A lot of people use it for those ways. So it is a major thoroughfare for not only vehicles, but for transit as well. But thinking about the future of Martin Way, um, you know, over the past 80 years, our, our region has kind of grown up around Martin Way. It's a it's a critical east-west route. It, it connects two of our largest cities, Lacey and Olympia, and it, it's a lifeline for the region, really. Um, since I-5 opened in the 60s, it's, it's really no longer the only way to get across town, but um, many parts of Martin Way still retain that feel of a throughway rather than a place that's, that's part of a community. Um, So if looking forward, we're, we're predicted to see very serious increases in population, uh, employment, um, increased congestion and conflicts as more people start to use Martin Way and live near there, um, increased multifamily development. So people are starting to locate their home choices near the corridor um, into the future as well. So Let's talk about transportation issues. There are a number of them on the corridor. Um, this is a, a major portion of the study was dedicated to exploring, identifying, and uh, coming up with solutions for the many transportation issues that we face on the corridor. Um, some of these, very briefly, I'll just run through them. Um, you know, we've got uh, sidewalk apps on the corridor, uh, bicycle lanes. Uh, they do exist in some parts, but they they don't feel very safe. Um, widely spaced crossings uh, between stoplights. They lead to uh, pedestrians crossing in the middle of the street very dangerously. Um, there's safety issues there. 
There are also uh, many access points for driveways as well, uh, can lead to conflict and potential collisions uh, on the corridor as people move, uh, try to get in and out or take lefts into uh, parking lots or, or things like that. Uh, so, you know, <clears throat> all these issues are important and they're all ones that we are exploring and have explored in, in the project, trying to identify solutions in all our alternatives. Excuse me. Oh, there we go. Thank you. So uh, we've also got a major portion of the project was also considering land use on Merton Way. So transportation and land use are extricable with each other, very interrelated. Um, they can't talk about one without talking about the other one. So uh, just a preliminary look at land use on the corridor. Uh, it's varied, but it, it is mostly developed about 80 percent, uh, mostly at low intensities, however. Uh, so there's a mix of different residential and commercial types, often from different eras. If you've taken a drive down the corridor, you'll see what I mean. Um, older development lacks infrastructure, uh, some utilities, uh, limited vacant land. Um, there's about 20% open space. This is mostly wetland um, and forested areas as well. Uh, a lot of potential for redevelopment on the corridor. Um, however, the uh, kind of ad hoc pattern of development uh, as it existed over the past couple decades has led to a lot of kind of a mixed bag of, of things along the corridor. So let's look at the vision. Uh, this is a vision that was agreed upon by the jurisdictions. Uh, the Martin Way corridor is an attractive mixed use, high density residential and commercial area where people enjoy walking and shopping, working and living. Um, it's important to understand, I think that the vision as it is laid out currently as you're reading it here uh, will not be achieved uh, if current development patterns uh, exist and, and continue to exist. So without uh, some sort of public intervention, um, the vision as it, as it reads right now will, will not be achieved over the, in the future. So we're seeing um, you know, the, the way the development is looking right now without some sort of uh, jurisdictional or coordinated intervention or kind of um, excuse me, thing like that, uh, we'll not see this vision being achieved over our, our lifetime likely. So thinking about our key needs on the corridor and moving that into goals, uh, you know, we, we want to improve safety for all users in all modes. Uh, we want to support inclusive growth. Uh, we want to balance these needs of different users that are using the corridor. It, Martin Way is often tries to be everything for everyone, um, and it, it it doesn't, is not as successful as it could be. Uh, so trying to think about ways that we can take these needs and, and move them into goals um, uh, as outlined here is, is really important. Uh, we're trying to do um, all of these things, um, you know, realistically not going to be uh, as successful in some as we are in others, but uh, these are, are definitely the goals of the project or trying to figure out how Martin Way can more effectively serve members of the community. So let's move into a preferred alternative. Let's talk about the preferred alternative. Um, so this is a major portion of the project that we've been working on. We've updated you last year. Uh, this is, has been in the works um, you know, since then, um, talking about preferred alternative for Martin Way, uh, what the steering committee would like it to look like, what we uh, can agree upon as uh, you know, the most feasible, the most um, transformative for Martin Way. Um, we, we began with three uh, different types of improvement suites for transportation, uh, minimal, moderate, and, and mighty. Uh, we had a discussion about, uh, you know, which one of these would be most uh, realistic and also the most uh, kind of transformative, which one could we uh, kind of make the most headway on, uh, while also important to understand we want to look forward into the future as well. So um, the modern improvements were the ones that the steering committee felt were the most uh, kind of within our grasp, uh, at least in the short term, I wanna emphasize. Um, these are not discrete necessarily. I think that um, it's important to understand that uh, while moderate improvement choice was the ultimately selected uh, as a preferred alternative for transportation on Martin Way, uh, we always have an eye towards building towards that mighty improvement. So uh, what does mighty mean? Um, it's basically looking at 
you know, these, these bigger investments at key locations to improve safety and mobility for people that are walking and biking and using transit. So um, a robust suite of improvements that we could explore. Um, it's not off the table completely. It, it might be a little bit more longer term. Um, however, uh, I just want to emphasize that uh, it's this modern improvement suite that, that was chosen was uh, is a step in a direction. Um, it's not just the end. So uh, a little briefly about land use alternatives. Um, there were three options that were considered. Uh, they are listed here. Uh, I th ultimately, the steering committee felt that uh, the affordable housing focused nodal development in the middle was the most important one uh, to talk about and to move forward with. Uh, so we would be concentrating our land use interventions at nodes to increase uh, affordable housing options. Uh, Martin Way is a critical affordable housing corridor. Um, it has the capacity to serve a lot of people in that sector. So um, concentrating these uh, kind of developments around intersections or what we call nodes, um, as opposed to kind of thinking about the whole corridor uh, as, as kind of its entire length is a bit intimidating. So uh, thinking about uh, concentrating those affordable housing and other kind of retail services at nodes uh, would probably be the best way to uh, move forward with regards to kind of being effective, uh, the most effective that you can be um, on the corridor, uh, talking about land use. <clears throat> so short-term transportation improvements, um, listed on the right, I, I'm not gonna read through all of them. However, um, I, I think it's important to understand that these are uh, just short-term improvements that are uh, some things that we can identify as easy wins, uh, something that might be a little less complex uh, would require less coordination or maybe a little bit more straightforward uh, in terms of revisioning Martin Way from a transportation perspective, making things safer for people that are walking, specifically uh, people that are using transit and people that are biking, as well as making things safer for people in vehicles. Um, I think all of these improvements yield safety benefits for all modes, uh, so it might not be uh, the best thing to think about in terms of kind of segregation by mode. Um, the corridor serves many different types of people all getting around differently. Um, however, you know, these safety improvements and these kind of transportation infrastructure improvements, at least in the short term, um, will have benefits for all. And then thinking about longer term improvements, um, as you can see on the right, I won't read them all to you, but uh, just kind of echoing what I said before, uh, building uh, our capacity to support more substantial transportation improvements on the corridor. It's a more of a continuum and not uh, a discrete package. So those types of improvements uh, such as uh, dedicated uh, business access transit lanes. So if you're thinking about a more of a dedicated transit lane, which would also accommodate uh, local traffic, if you wanted to pull into a parking lot or something like that to visit a business, you would be able to, um, however, no through traffic on the on the, in the lane. Um, these kinds of transit improvements that are a little bit more complex, a little bit more um, you know, challenging to implement in the long term at least, uh, would be something that we would want to build towards on Martin Way. Uh, this is not gonna happen tomorrow, of course, but uh, we do have a mind and an eye towards kind of setting up a foundation for those shorter term improvements to build onto these longer term ones as well. Um, it's important to understand also that you know transit service is only as good as the street network. Uh, so that last little bullet about um, you know building out the street grid, there are a lot of different things. Some are more obvious, some are less obvious. Uh, so just want to call out that uh, making transit service, uh, improving transit service on the corridor, uh, there are a number of different things that you can do. Some are more um, straightforward, some are less straightforward. But that uh, building out the street network uh, would behoove me to to emphasize that. I think I'm gonna pass it off to Allison after, oh, there yep. we go. Um, I'll pass it off to Allison right now. Um, she's gonna take the presentation all the way home. Thanks. So uh, we looked at, as Aiden went through those different options for addressing some of the goals we had in the corridor around transportation improvements. And in looking at land use, we were looking for ways to support, to, to kind of support those transportation improvements. Um, and in looking at and addressing some of the other goals we had, such as um, 
how do we uh, support the growth that we're likely to see on the corridor in a way that's more inclusive? And so the option, the alternative that worked best for those was one that focused on a nodal approach. And a node in this context, if you think about maybe a quarter mile around a major intersection, would be an area of higher density um, where there's, you're kind of focusing something that we heard from some of our consultants looking at economic analysis on the corridor. If you can kind of focus your incentives and tools and energy in some areas, you can see a lot more change um, and that can have spillover effects that can help achieve goals in the rest of the corridor. So ultimately we looked at a couple of different options for nodes, but the preferred alternative is one in which there's a really strong emphasis on incentivizing and um, retaining affordable housing on the corridor, particularly in these areas that'll be well connected to other services and um, would be supportive of those different transportation nodes, including transit on the corridor. So another aspect of the preferred alternative for land use is that we think about carefully about um, how to build how to build a sense of place for the corridor. Um, it feels very long right now and that although there's a lot of reasons people go to the corridor, there's less um, kind of feeling of like you know, a place along the corridor. So making sure to emphasize landscaping, visual aspects um, and aesthetic considerations to kind of build um, an identity at, in these nodal developments as we do them. So go ahead to the next slide. So just to talk a little bit more about that nodal concept, in order to explore how this might work, um, we picked a few potential areas where that could function as nodes along the corridor for our analysis. Um, and the jurisdictions would need to go through a planning process after this to identify you know, exactly where nodes would be and what they would look like and those components of it. Um, but we looked at four, a potential of four different nodes of different intensity along the corridor. Um, and those are shown here. Go ahead to the next slide. And what we could see is that one thing to emphasize is uh, when we looked in our alternatives analysis at how population and housing along the corridor would change, in all the different scenarios, we're likely to see a lot more people living on the corridor, a big increase in housing compared to how it's been historically. It's just the trend we're, we're already seeing toward more multifamily development. But go ahead and, and hit the next slide. That, um, oh, go back one. Just wanted the, that scenario that looks at really focusing on um, affordable housing within this nodal development. We saw the, the greatest potential for increasing housing on the corridor. And this, so this scenario helps support the goals we had for supporting the type of um, kind of inclusive growth on the corridor. And also our sustainable Thurston land use plan where we really wanna see more development, more housing along our urban corridors where they're well connected to services and transportation options. And that's one of the reasons that this, this um, option was seen to be the best for meeting the, the goals and the vision for the corridor. Next slide. So moving on to our action plan, as part of the alternatives analysis, we looked at a range of different tools, um, different strategies, and, and we're fleshing those out now in the action plan for how to achieve this preferred alternative. And those range from regulatory approaches to um, permitting changes, different approaches for financial tools, and different kinds of investments. And there are um, different kinds of regulatory zoning changes and, and things that'll be part of the package. But what we really heard from the analysis that we've done and working with some of the experts who looked at market conditions on the corridor and talking with people on the corridor is that uh, the constraints on the corridor, you know, we really would need to focus on these upper level tools. Um, there, while there are some regulatory changes that could be made, the things that will really move the needle is, is we need to put some market incentives in place, um, and we really need to continue coordination on the corridor. So some of those things might be looking at um, things like tax increment financing, ways to fund the type of development we wanna see on the corridor, um, doing different kinds of 
public-private partnerships in ways that, that make it feasible for people to do the kind of development we would like to see on the corridor, making uh, civic investments, whether that's kind of aggregating land, investing in some kind of um, public anchor institution that helps draw in other types of investment, or just in, in terms of developing um, some kind of organization or group or body that continue to have conversations about the corridor, whether that's a business improvement district. And we've talked a lot about the role, the future role of transit on the corridor and how that uh, it really spans different jurisdictions and needs to continue to be a conversation about uh, for intercity transit, their role having uh, both as a, um, a landowner on the corridor with their, with their new building that they've put in there, as well as the importance of Martin Way to their route network. And just how do we move toward that more network feel um, and having transit playing that role on that corridor uh, and in a broader space. So continuing those conversations is part of the discussion as well. Next slide. So we took this alternatives analysis out to the public and got some feedback. We had an online open house and a virtual public meeting back um, in the early summer, late spring. And what we've really heard from people then and throughout this project is there's very strong support from the public for jurisdictions to be proactive in using resources and finding new ways to support the vision for Martin Way. There's really strong support for making transportation improvements on the corridor, particularly for walking and transit. There is definitely concern from people in how that affects um, the timing and the way that you drive on the corridor and access to businesses. But people recognize that it is, um, there are a lot of safety concerns on the corridor. There are a lot of ways that right now it, it, it could serve people better who are using different modes. And there's really strong support for that notable, that nodal affordable housing focus. Uh, it's a, I think there's a really great nexus uh, seeing Martin Way as, as an area where we have a, a, some affordable housing options now and we don't want to lose that. Uh, and so that's a concern going forward. And also it will be the place that it, it's easy for people to connect to, to different parts of the community. And so it's a logical place to make sure uh, people that, that we retain those options as we're growing. Next slide. So those next steps right now, we're taking all that information and putting that together in, an, in a kind of a strategic action plan that'll go to the jurisdictions. And that information then will filter into local plans, comprehensive plans, joint plans, transportation improvement plans, different kinds of projects you might see come forward in the future. Next slide. And so I just want to leave with a couple of thoughts, uh, kind of wrapping up what we've learned so far in the Martin Way Corridor project. There are a lot of things. But one thing, you know, just want to emphasize what we see when we looked at the alternatives and in the future is that, um, you know, without some direct intervention, we're unlikely to achieve the vision that the jurisdictions have for Martin Way, that one and uh, a roadway that, that right now it still feels like it's dominated by cars. Um, and in order to shift to something that's more multimodal, more supportive of other modes, and we need to probably change things a little bit and, and uh, take a stronger hand on the type of development that comes in if we want to see something that's different, because the market is driving things to look like the way it looked and it's looked up to this point. But uh, what we also saw is that those interventions on the transportation side can really do a lot to improve safety for all modes of travel and make, um, make it a lot easier for people to choose to use, to want to, to bot, bike or walk or take transit on the corridor. So there are things that are within grasp uh, that can make some sizable improvements in the corridor. And on land use, there are things that we can do that would really build vibrancy of the corridor, build economic activity, accommodate growth in a way that, that keeps some of our most vulnerable communities having options in an area where they can easily access services and jobs and other, other parts of our community. But in order to do this, we're really going to continue to need some regional focus on the corridor and what that looks like, how we continue that conversation after this planning effort is done is something that we're definitely talking about with staff um, at the jurisdictions as with our steering committee. But I think also boards like 
like this group, it's something to think about. Um, I think something with Martin Way is that it it is a really core um, roadway that connects our communities, but it's also sort of been everyone's backyard. It's not been anyone's central focus for a long time. And we just kind of rely on it for so many different things without really thinking about what is the um, role that it plays for us and how could we really make it um, serve the needs of our community better in the future. And so it, it needs a focus the way we focus on downtowns and central areas uh, in order to see that happen. And that is all I have. The next slide has our contact information. There's a lot more information up on the website and happy to take any questions. Can you uh, stop sharing your screen? Great. Are there any questions? I guess I will. I will jump in. Um, both both Brian and I have uh, hands up. I don't know if you saw. Oh, it. great. Oh, I can't. I can't. Can't see it. Go ahead, Danny. Uh, actually, Brian, Brian was right ahead of me. So go ahead, Brian. Okay. Go ahead, Brian. Yes. Um, I just want to make sure I heard quickly at the very beginning of the presentation when you're talking about usage on Martin Way. Did I hear correctly that 25% is the public transportation, i.e. Uh, inner city transit authorities buses? Is that correct? Yeah, the, for the ridership, about 20, about a quarter of all the riders for inner city transit on the day, they're on the routes that go along Martin Way. They're not all, it's not that they're all on Martin Way at the same time, but about, about a quarter of all of inner city transit's ridership is on one of the, the routes that go along Martin Way. And the busiest st stops aside from like, you know, if you think of the Olympia Transit Center or the Lacey Transit Center, those are the biggest stops. But aside from that, the, the stops with the most boardings are on Martin Way. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. That, that helps with uh, formulating some future questions when it comes up for discussion. Uh, now, now you're Danny. Yeah. Um, so Allison, I have a question in terms of like the development of nodes. Does any of this involve any upzoning of areas? Yes, definitely could. I mean, upzoning gives you like a specific idea of what it is. I think what we're talking about, what would come out of this, what we would recommend is for jurisdictions to go through um, a planning process of identifying specifically, you know, what would be the boundaries, where, which nodes are the nodes. That's kind of one of the first steps you have to do. What are the boundaries of those nodes? And then what are the uses and design guidelines within those? A node, when we're talking about a node, it's the concept called transit oriented development. It's usually you're looking for higher density, higher heights uh, within a period, within a, a smaller area. And those are graduated out. So it's kind of higher in the center and then maybe a little bit lower out. Um, and some of these nodes are, are would be adjacent to existing single family neighborhoods. So there would need to be a, and there's some of them are adjacent to industrial areas and some of them are adjacent to existing commercial areas. So there needs to be a lot of thought, I think, given to exactly how those should look. Um, and so I think each of those nodes, I think there's a real opportunity to create a lot of identity within each of them that makes them destinations. So some of that might be increasing density and an upzoning approach, but it's it's probably there's a, there's a lot of different pieces to that. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. And I know upzone can be a trigger word. It's not really for me, um, but uh, I just, I bring it up because, um, you know, I'm really interested in a, uh, if it's possible, a successful transfer of development rights program in Thurston County. Thurston County is currently looking at how the criteria for designating long-term agricultural land. And um, uh, that's a really, really challenging issue. As you can imagine, There's there was land that was uh, downzoned to agriculture many years ago. And um, farmers were promised, you know, that a TDR program would help uh, pay them for the lost value of their land and it never happened. And so now the county's looking at more designating more agricultural lands without having um, finished the last pieces of the puzzle. And so when I see things like this, I see, you know, an opportunity to, um, to incorporate that tool or other types of tools that can transfer development rights around and help us preserve rural lands um, intentionally while we uh, put density in the areas that we really like it. So I just 
I know TDRs are um, very cumbersome programs, uh, but I also want to make sure that it remains on the table because these conversations are happening in other spaces. And I just want to connect some dots. So thank you, Allison. Yeah, I think that's the TDR program is a great one to, to think about in this context. But I, and I think something to remember with it is that uh, what we're seeing, it, it needs to be done really thoughtfully. What we're seeing now and what we hear from developers and looking at economic or with our economic analysis is that it doesn't economically, the type of development we want to see on Martin Way isn't something the market is going to create on its own. And so we want to make sure, like with the TDR program, if it's something where it creates an additional cost for people to do higher density, um, that that creates a disincentive, can create a disincentive for that. And that's, so I think there's probably creative ways to think about how to incorporate TDRs into it. Um, but I, I think what we're seeing here in, in the way a traditional TDR market would work, um, we don't have the market right now that, that wants that higher density along the corridor. That's something we have expressed that we want for many, many reasons in our community to support public health and climate goals and um, efficient use of services and many different things. And the market isn't just providing it on its own. And so I think we're looking for other tools to, to say, how can we change those numbers and make it work? Yeah, thanks, Allison. I appreciate that. Um, and I just, I, I just always wanna raise it because it's being discussed in other circles. And if any point, TDR gets ruled out as a viable option, then that needs to be communicated to other people who are hoping that it, it that it will be a viable option. Um, and also, you know, you mentioned in terms of like, you know, what what is it the market uh, will provide? Uh, one of the most successful things that we've been able to do in the city of Olympia to get the kind of housing we want is for the city to purchase land and say what it is that we want on it and put it out uh, to developers to see who will who will deliver what we want. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Hi, Pete. You're up. We lose Pete. Um, in the meantime, though, John O'Callaghan and Michelle Murray John, have their hands okay, John, up. Oh. Okay, Go great. Ahead, thank you. Uh, over the last several years, one of the things that we keep hearing is affordable housing, affordable housing, affordable housing. Affordable housing means something different to everybody, okay? I can't afford a mansion. Uh, I don't know, maybe Andy can, but I sure as heck can't. One of the ways that I learned a long time ago on how to express what somebody can afford was by a percentage of their income, okay, of what they actually have to spend every month. Is that something that we can start doing? Because, if, for example, on Sixth Street, uh, I think it's almost ten years now. They put uh, they put some apartments down there, uh, right next to the gym and over by Belltown. And it started out at $800 a month. I don't know what it's going up to now. That was for a single family and that was considered affordable. Uh, we, we really don't have a good explanation that we can give to the general public anytime we say affordable housing. And the only way that I can think of is to say, well, affordable housing would be 30% of your take home income. You understand? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that's, so, that's just a suggestion, but I think it would help a whole lot of people uh, a whole lot more and, uh, to understand what you're talking about when you say affordable housing. Thank you. Yeah. So the definition that we use for this report, and it people use different ones, um, and it's something for folks to think for jurisdictions as they're looking at policies to think about how they want to define it. But when we were looking at, you know, what would increase affordable housing, we were looking at um, what would be affordable, so the portion of income for folks who are making it 80% of the area median income. And so that the amount might change over time, but it would mean that in some ways the um, housing, the units that are available on the corridor, proportion of them would be restricted to people making a certain amount of money. Um, and, and some of them may not all have those restrictions, but that would be kind of the level you'd be looking at. Great, thanks, uh, Michelle, and then we'll go up to Pete. I see Pete's back. 
So kind of a similar suggestion, but on the transportation side, and I know this was included in the survey that went out, but putting wor certain words out is, is important for people to be more cognizant and that's accessibility. I know you talked about walking, but walking and using a manual wheelchair are very different, especially when someone's thinking about how to construct a sidewalk because the more cracks are, you know, the, you know, separations in the sidewalk, the more chances of tipping over my wheelchair. <laughs> so um, I think it's important to add accessibility into the presentations so that it's in people that don't have mobility issues. That's not the first thought that they have in their head when they're hearing about walking and building sidewalks and having encountered many issues with um, construction, especially when they were doing College Street, um, you know, they, they put in some nice sidewalks, but they're not necessarily accessible for people with mobility issues. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Excellent point. And thank you for bringing it up. Um, and and we, we should have probably made it more front and center. One of the criteria when we were looking at the transportation options was how would it improve accessibility? So how would it, how would it improve um, how would it upgrade things for ADA standards? How would it provide better connections for people? That's definitely been something we've been thinking about for this study. Because we've definitely heard from people that Martin Way is, a, is very challenging for people with different kinds of, of um, it, mobility challenges, whether that's vision or the way you move, or it, it can be very, very challenging to navigate. Hey, Pete. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Sorry, I got disconnected there temporarily. Um, but I just wanted to say, first of all, uh, uh, great report, uh, uh, great uh, presentation. This, uh, everything that's been said is generally consistent with the report we did back in 2012 about our, our urban corridors. So I really appreciate uh, following through on that in this particular piece of work. Um, the one thing I did I did wonder about is uh, not a lot said about public space and, and the importance of investing in, in public space, either by requiring private development to have uh, public spaces or investing uh, public money uh, to create some of those spaces as focal points. And so I hope, I hope uh, that will be considered in the future. And then uh, another thing I, I didn't see any mention of, I haven't, I have to admit, I haven't read the report in detail. Is there anything on on uh, potential future rail? Uh, as this seems like an obvious rail uh, corridor, either light rail or commuter rail corridor uh, into the downtown area, and I wondered if that had been considered at all. Two great questions. I didn't say a lot about about open space and public space, but we did talk about it a lot in the study. Um, so. So one way of thinking about it is that in those nodes, what we've talked about within those nodes, there would need to be a part of the design requirements is there needs to be some kind of public amenity space. Um, we're not thinking along Martin Way, you know, I think no one was thinking that some kind of large park, but there are large areas of open space. Martin Way crosses three watersheds and Wetlands are pretty omnipresent through certain sections of the corridor and are kind of, you know, can be, are, are something that limits development potential in some sections of the corridor. But something we talked about is, is not developing those areas so much in a formal park, but how do we utilize them so people can access them for views or like a, kind of bring some of that um, beautification into it, seeing them as an amenity instead of kind of a barrier. Um, but bringing some of those public spaces that are that are small and community building, particularly within that nodal concept, is something we've we've talked we talked about quite a bit. Uh, and yes, using different kinds of public or private funding to see that accomplished. And the other thing for rail, we didn't talk a lot about rail. I think probably because the time frame for rail is a little bit longer than we were looking at for that study, but. Uh, Aiden was going through the transportation options and the long-term conversation we want, or the conversation we want to continue is over the long-term, what are the correct transit options for this corridor and how do we support that continuing um, 
uh, growth of transit. So I think that starts with bus rapid transit being extended through the corridor and better supporting that. And I think you know that might provide a foundation long term for something like light rail. I mean, it's a logic. It is a logical place if we get ever get to that point where we would support it. Um, but I think starting with in the near future, there's there's a lot of appetite and interest in extending that bus rack, rapid transit. Thank you. Great. Well, then I guess um, my only comments is, um, and, and Pete didn't mention this, is um, I remember back in 2012, we did a urban corridor study and it has a lot of great information in it. And it basically has been sitting on a shelf waiting for this next <laughs> study to come about to sort of reiterate things that we already talked about, you know, a decade ago. And so my, my question is, is what's the tangible next steps? And so we're not back here 12 years ago saying, hey, you know what, we should do a study on the Martin Wake corridor, see if we can, you know, uh, change anything. Because I do think, number one, there has to be public investment in the corridor, just period, right? If we want to see a change, it, counting on the private sector, parcel by parcel, upgrading the entire Martin Way corridor, um, it's never, it's never going to happen. You know, it just, it's, we're so far off from that. And so there has to be some sort of strategy of public investment. And where I think the public investment should start is sidewalks, <laughs> In, um, in, in accommodating the pedestrian slash um, bicycle corridor, right? I mean, and we, we could start at one end or, or take sections and, and have a public commitment that we're going to build out um, the, the public side of that, which would be a huge investment, right? Which in, in the corridor that would make it more attractive, number one. Number, number two, if you talk to any of the developers who we're asking to meet our vision, the, the, they all will say it is just too difficult to develop um, along this corridor, especially if it's within the urban growth areas of any of the cities, because it's a, it's a more complicated process. And so I, I know some recommendations you listed out saying that, permitting, use of permitting. Well, the, in my mind, that has to be the, the, the first priority because as long as it's too complicated for anyone to invest in, in, the, in the corridor, they won't invest in the corridor. Um, so it's, to me, it's gotta be public investment and a, and a concerted effort of public investment saying, you know, as a, as a region, we're gonna find funding to improve that corridor um, where we can, right? which is obviously in, in, in our right of ways. Um, and then we have to change the, the permitting. I mean, I, I would love for uh, a TDR to be um, viable there, but we can't get any, <laughs> we can't get any uh, uh, growth going there regardless, and let alone asking people to pay more for higher, you know, uh, for more density. We want all the density we could possibly get along that quarter and it's just not coming because it's too hard to develop it. So I, I just hope that, you know, as a transportation policy board, we can make some recommendations that we're gonna make this a priority. Um, because if we don't, it's just, we'll be back here 10 years from now um, talking about the exact same things. So I appreciate the report. I think what's more important is the execution of the, the report. I mean, what, what's going to change this time compared to what we saw 10 years ago when we had a very similar report telling us we need to basically do the exact same thing we're telling, telling everyone to do now? Brian's got his yeah. hand up. Okay, Brian. And then, uh, Amy, I thought I saw your hand up at some point, too. But. Yeah, um, I just wanted to kind of reiterate something that you were talking about of starting off with the simple things of the walking paths and the biking paths but i also want to make sure that when we do the biking paths i know this is going to sound a, I'm, I'm not sure how many people would agree i see a lot of bicyclists that don't really understand the rule of the road and i want to make sure that if we make those safe biking paths 
but they go with the flow of traffic. In other words, the correct way. We don't need to have them big enough where you can have bicycles passing each other going opposite directions. Uh, and so I think that's something to consider when you're looking at that. Additionally, when you were talking about how to bring economic growth to that area, I think the upzoning is a good way of doing it where you have retail on the bottom, uh, maybe even uh, businesses or something on the bottom floor, second floors, then residential uh, on top, which again, that can be that affordable housing, which I agree with the conversation that was done uh, with John O'Callaghan saying, what if we need to define affordable housing? Because I heard two different definitions there. John was saying it's it's 30% of your income, and that's what we need to kind of try to help out with. But then from the presenter stated, well, it's for those that are that make less than a certain percentage, which then it comes down to, are we looking at subsidizing the housing, or are we looking at getting it so that when the housing is built and such that some uh, pathway is set up that it's not so difficult to do? Because from what I'm learning, uh, being on city council, a lot of studying in reference to housing, the most expensive part to housing other than the building materials and the labor is the permitting process, the studies, all these things that we as a jurisdiction and municipalities put in place for those developers and they have to pass that cost on to somebody and that ends up being the people who pay the rent or who pay the mortgage. And so when we look at that, I think we really do need to, if we're going to discuss affordable housing, we need to find a good definition and how we make it affordable. Uh, as I said, both, pre, both individuals I, brought up some. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I just realized we're way over time. <laughs> um, okay. Do you have I'm something sorry. real quick? Yeah, no problem. Do you have something real quick or? No, I, I'm good. Uh, I just think we need to take the private sector realities into consideration. Um, and I was just going to weigh it, just mention that when you get over five stories, the market rents don't support the cost of construction because it changes the construction type. Um, yeah. So if we want to incentivize density beyond five stories, that's a whole nother conversation. And then retail on the ground floor, the cost is not in line with the market right now. So just we, we need to have the private sector being a part of these solutions. Otherwise, we're going to create really well-intentioned policy that is not implementable. Yeah, understandable. I know we, we ran through that in Lacey too. We like, we, we mandated retail on the bottom and, uh, you know, multi and then it just set no one developed it because the market wasn't, you know, couldn't meet that demand, but okay. Um, Peter, do you have something real quick or can we go on to our next agenda item? Uh, I think my is just a general question for uh, when we have when we go to uh, for when we close. I just need to ask a quick question, really quick, but not about this. Okay, then let's go. Let's go on. Um, and I um, let's go on to our, our legislative priority issues. And then if we don't, if we don't, uh, if we're running out of time, we can move the uh, school walking route map projects to our next meeting. But let's go to our legislative priority issues. Karen. Thank you. Berlin is putting the slides up for me. So um, you're used to me coming and talking about this. We have been having some conversations about the state legislative session coming up in January uh, of 2023. Um, we, both you and the council, appointed a subcommittee to look at this, and we have uh, presented them with some of our options, and uh, they have weighed in on that. So next slide. Um, just a quick reminder, we're looking at maybe five or less priority issues. We have very short visits with our legislators, and so we want to make sure that we have time to cover them. And we also are always looking for partners. So if the Association of Washington Business or the Association of Counties or the like uh, are supportive, then that's really helpful in moving things forward. We also, um, I, I just wanna let you know that often we will do a little homework in advance of meeting with our legislators to say, ah, this issue is really important to this person. So we may highlight different parts of our issues depending on who we're meeting with. And then just so you know, uh, 
these aren't the only five issues that we are tracking during session. Next slide. So the subcommittee, as I mentioned, uh, you had Andy and uh, Commissioner Mejia and Renee on uh, for the council, for the policy board. And then we had some volunteers who said they would step up and help. Next slide. So we're gonna start with the first issue, which is I-5, hard shoulder running and keeping our place in line. Um, and Mark's gonna talk about that for a minute. And this is an issue that has been on our legislative priorities for the past five or six years. Mark. Um, so there won't be a, a financial request for this session. Um, what, what you're looking at here is a reminder that in Move Ahead Washington, uh, the, the state allocated $75 million for the design of a solution for the I-5 going through the Nisqually River Delta. Um, but uh, folks, hopefully remember that, that the, the projected cost for that design was um, $125 million. And so this session will be thanking them for the investment, but reminding them that that, um, that wasn't complete to get us through that design. We still will need from the state or, and or federal government $56 million. And also we will be, um, really that, that request will be $57.5 million because we want to make sure that at the same time, we're also able to design some of the lower cost solutions that will make those investments work better, um, like the part-time shoulder use in south, on southbound I-5 between Sleater, Kinney, and Henderson, which has showed some pretty, um, uh, pretty substantial improvements in that congestion during that peak time for a, a modest investment of about 15 million. And so that 1.5 million is, is also just for the design. So we'll be reminding them that we will need that um, in the 25-27 biennium. Okay, thank you, Mark. Next slide. So here's the other issues that we talked about. One is the location of the new regional airport. We have had that conversation uh, at this meeting today. Once again, we would be asking for some work on uh, some rural projects. So uh, some preliminary planning has been done on some of the, especially um, state highways as main streets in Tenino, Yelm, Rainier, Bucota, Grand Mound. So we're putting that together. Um, and again, uh, we have had that on the agenda before. Continuing to support broadband expansion, we have seen, uh, we had a presentation from the tribe, I believe in the last month or so, uh, to look at what they're doing, but just keeping that momentum going. Um, and then a lot of us will be talking about just the public meeting requirements and clarifications around COVID. Currently, there is a requirement that we have a physical space for the meeting and that someone is available in case a public person wants to come. And that can just be problematic, especially in, um, um, you know, sort of the resources used to have somebody available just in case. And so we're working with a number of associations about that, want to be accessible to the public, but also want to balance that with available staff and space. And then finally, uh, looking at regional mobility grants, these are large grants that are available um, to cities and towns. They are under the definition of local government is who may apply. And that excludes tribes and metropolitan planning organizations such as us. So we would be interested in adding um, those two as eligible for the grant. And just to let you know, this particular grant program is undersubscribed this year. So they have more money than they have applicants. So we'd be happy to be an applicant. Um, so those are the issues we're looking at. Um, it's a little more than five, but I think when we look at that public meeting piece, um, that's gonna be one that may be a mention rather than a, a major issue. Next slide. So I just wanted to get a sense today. Uh, the council will be taking action next month at their meeting 
to finalize the priority list and then and then we'll put together uh, something pretty as a leave behind uh, one or two pager uh, hopefully one that um, talks about these issues so providing that detail like we talked about on i5 today with charts tables pictures and a little more explanation and then we're looking at scheduling appointments, likely in mid-November. And then just a reminder, the legislative session um, basically uh, starts on January 9th, which feels like it is tomorrow. So just to review today, if people have questions or if you wanted to do a little straw poll on, yeah, this looks like a good group. Remember that sometimes things show up, just like the airport issue has shown up. Um, so our most important priority may suddenly be switched because the legislature is dealing with something we didn't expect. So um, open to questions and if we could stop sharing now. Any questions? I, I do think what we should do is on, obviously the leave behind pieces <laughs> the big important piece because that's what we're sort of going off of i think you know you asterisk three three items there um and there's two others but i i think those three are are the, are the big three um and then on the other two we can have it you know uh, you know other priorities but you know really focus on the on on those big three which are really really important obviously the regional airport is something we need to continue to have some conversations with and um but you know i think that the focus on those other you know the, the three asterisks are the are the main ones mm -hmm. and those are ones that we have brought before so yeah. um and i think i see brian has his hand up brian yes um i was wondering if on the leave behind if you could also uh have a section on there of items that have already been approved but just keep getting pushed back good example is the uh 510 loop around yelm every, it seems like every year it gets pushed back another year uh if you can just kind of remind <laughs> them that these are things that have already been scheduled mm -hmm. money set aside and we would like to have them be you know to remind them that these are still not even being accomplished at this time absolutely and i think we can work that into the uh projects that we're looking at in the rural community as, uh, you know, that is always an issue. That's one of the things, and we're talking about I-5, hold our place in line. Don't keep pushing us forward. So that's definitely a message. And some of the new uh, legislation that passed, it's really hard right now to estimate um, what kind of funding that will generate and what the timeline will be. So we will keep an eye on the, the um, loop. For you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Questions, comments? I think Pete has his hand up. Uh, thank you. Just just quickly, I, I see the recognition of rural projects, but what about urban, uh, the, the north urban area? Of course, a lot of projects here that are as well uh, potentially mm -hmm. needed of funding, some of which have funding already, but again, have been mm -hmm. uh, pushed out. So. Okay, so I think perhaps we need to have a separate issue that talks about um, funding that's lagging as far as being available. So I think if it pleases the group, we would sort of bundle those, some of those together, like the Yelm Loop and some of the projects um, in the urban area as well, and say, hey, we've been waiting for these. We need these to be moved up. Does that yeah. help? I think, I think that. Uh, sense you know for example the the next interchange <laughs> after 111 um you know the the college street interchange we're just waiting on funding for that too and we have for a long time and that's that's a really big one because it gets backed up all the way on the i-5 and there's they're running on the on the shoulder of i-5 all the way down waiting for the stoplight um so i mean that is long overdue and it was one of the things that we talked about when, on the Martin Lake corridor because we walked right underneath that. You could see how horrible that interchange is. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I'm asking, you know, well, we're just waiting on funding, we're just waiting on funding. But what mm -hmm. we realized, what Lacey realized on the 111 interchange is the only reason that ever got funded is because we pushed, 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 pushed for it. 
And so I feel like we need to continue down the corridor and continue pushing on those, those interchanges that have failed. Um, so you're right, maybe we need a separate talk about that for sure. And I'll reach back out to each jurisdiction. So if there's a particular project that you want to mention in that, hey, we're in line for funding, let's get some coming um, that you guys can uh, let me know that. So I will do that outreach. Okay, great. Okay, that's else? all I have. Thank you. Okay. So next up is the call for projects tie breaking process options. Paul. Good morning, transportation policy board members. Just give me a moment while I share my screen with you and get set up here. Um, so today we are going to be talking about our 2022 call for projects process and how um, you're going to have the opportunity to select projects. And, and so what I'm trying to do is um, identify some toolkits for you to make tough decisions. Um, so let me just let me just step back and say that our uh, applications were due last Friday. And our next step is for to convene a, a peer technical review of the proposals that will be done by the Technical Advisory Committee um, next Thursday. Before then, staff is going through the proposals, making sure that all the application forms are properly completed, all the boxes are checked, and reviewing how the applicants scored their proposals and vetting those scores. After the technical review, we will be um, presenting those projects uh, to the community at large for public comment. And so at that time, we will be releasing all of those proposals to you, the policymakers, for your own review. Um, but today, we're not going to be talking so much about the projects themselves as much as your process for formulating a recommendation to the regional council. And this is one of your most important duties as transportation policy board members, because you're not only trying to advocate for your jurisdiction's project and advancing that, you're taking a look at the big picture for the region and considering which of these projects that are submitted are the most impactful in terms of um, achieving our region's transportation policies, but also being human thinking about um, how these projects align with your constituents' community values and making sure that they reflect how uh, our transportation system should continue to develop and improve as communities. Um, so with that, let's just jump into it. Um, so your recommendation to the council is first and foremost gonna be influenced by the level of funding that's available to award to projects by geographic area. And, and, and I'll highlight what those geographic areas are, but that's, that's your greatest constraint. Um, so we're programming out funding for 2025, 26, and 27, and you're gonna be constrained by how much funding you can allocate to projects in rural areas, urban small areas, and the urban medium area. This is a new process. Um, we have gone from really kind of a, a strictly policy-based um, selection process based on some target estimates for applicants to apply for down to a competitive point-based process. So now the projects have scores. The higher the score, the more impactful the project. So those will take, uh, those you will take into consideration as, as your highest priority, going down from highest points to lowest points and how you want to award funding. And then of course, considering the applicant's funding requests, how much funding do we have to program to those highest ranking projects? And after all those highest ranking projects, what funding then is left to distribute to the lower ranking projects? And and doing that with allocating any surplus flexible funding or perhaps transportation alternatives funding um, that, that wasn't requested through the application process. So I'm gonna to try to explain and walk through how all this could work. But to start it off, um, I just wanna highlight our three geographic areas. We, in white, we have the urban medium area, 
The dark green is the urban small and that lighter green is the rural area. And then we have flexible funding that can be programmed to any of the geographic areas. So overall, we're programming 11 point, nearly $11.4 million. Um, 9.3 million is in surface transportation block grant funding. This is funding that's um, of course used for bridges, roads, um, a uh, variety of construction project studies, transportation alternatives funding. We have a little over 2 million. This is most well known for bicycle pedestrian type projects, but could also be used for environmental mitigation, um, historic preservation and projects of the like. And so each of these grant funds are broken down into uh, um, minimum amounts that we must program for these geographic areas. And so I said, we're not gonna talk about projects today, um, but applicants submitted 14 proposals that are their priorities for grant funding. What's not shown on this list is an additional five proposals that applicants want to submit directly to the contingency list. Should we receive redistributed funding or obligation authority in the years between our calls for projects? We received eight urban medium proposals. Interestingly, six of them are, are for intersection improvements and more specifically roundabouts. We received four urban small proposals and two rural proposals. And this is covering everything from construction projects to design and engineering, a um, couple of planning studies and projects also seeking right of way. And of course, for transportation alternatives, we only received two proposals, one from inner city transit to continue funding their walk and roll youth education program and a proposal from the city of Tenino to um, do design and engineering to extend the Yelm Tenino Trail study, uh, Yelm Tenino Trail from Tenino City Park out to West Tenino City limits. And, and I'll just be upfront. Um, we expect that there's gonna be surplus transportation alternative funding that could be awarded to help make projects whole. So looking at this table, this is really um, how the projects are sorting out based on their number of points. So for urban medium projects, four applications scored eight points, three scored seven points and one scored six points. So of these three tiers, um, the eight point projects are requesting over 10 million in surface transportation block grant funding, when we see that we only have about 6.4 million to program. So right there of those four proposals right now with that scoring, um, they've, they've maxed out. So there's a challenge right there where you're gonna have to break the tie. Now, I just wanna clarify that this is the applicants self-scored proposals. So staff is gonna review these and vet these points. So um, how many projects tie by the time they come to you will change from what you're seeing here. But at a preview, this is how uh, things are shaping up. And so each of these, we would only, you would be only comparing and uh, breaking ties for projects within each geographic area. So you do this separately for the urban medium, urban small, and then the rural. So just to remind you those, there was two points maximum for each of the four uh, evaluation criteria for efficient use of federal funds, greenhouse gas emissions reduction, the sustainable Thurston urban corridors and centers and equity. And to remind you sustainable Thurston or corridors and centers did not apply to the urban, small and rural proposals. So when you're going through the ranked projects and sorting it out, um, you'll, you'll, you'll see that for both urban, small and the rural, um, the request exceeds what's available. So you do have that STBG flexible. Um, we set aside 600,000 for the rural community support program. So you have, 824,400 that you could use to help um, 
fully fund or mostly fund those higher ranking projects in these categories. In addition, we know that there's going to be some transportation alternatives funding. So you could also use that from each of the geographic areas to help augment funding and awarding projects in the geographic areas. So let's let's jump into what some of the tie breaking options are. You have a simple majority vote, pairwise comparison, and rank choice voting. And I'm I'm just gonna go through each of these because we're literally at the doorstep of the holiday season. Uh, let's let's use Halloween candy as our example um, to, to simplify how this could work out. So for a simple majority vote, this this is just what it is. The the project or candidate with the most votes wins. Um, so if if we were to just do a short poll, which we're not going to do, but we could do a hands up. If you were out trick or treating and you come to a door and the the person residing there comes to you and presents a bowl of candy and they say, choose one, which would you choose? Hershey's dark chocolate bar, Reese's peanut butter cup, or Junior Mints? You would you'd take that. So we would tally the votes. The one with the majority of the votes would, would be the top choice in the winner. And so this is suitable when you're really coming down to two or three proposals where you just wanna select one as the top contender. You could use this straight off to, to break a tie, say, between um, two uh, urban small projects, or you could use this later on in outcome after doing a pairwise comparison or rank choice voting to really narrow it down. Let's talk about pairwise comparison. In this case, we're going to um, uh, use it for four fruit candies. We're going to um, look at a comparison where we're going to do a head-to-head -head, um, comparison um, with each candy. So in this instance, we have uh, four different candies. So there's going to be six direct comparisons. Um, so you're going to have Skittles versus Sour Patch Kids in that top choice. And so perhaps Chair Ryder likes Skittles because they're nice and shiny and colorful on the outside. And you bite into it, it's soft and it's it's a little bit tangy, but and sweet. Um, but others like Starburst because of um, they, you know, it's individually wrapped and, and they can hand the candy out that way. So you're gonna go through and compare these based on on your preferences and, and a vote is done. Um, so you're gonna vote for each comparison. And so in this case, comparing Sour Patch Kids to Skittles, Skittles came out the winner. I'm not gonna go through each of these, but the winner um, gets recorded in the matrix. Now, if you have a tie in these matrix, um, each candy in this case would receive a half point, but for simplification, we're just gonna avoid the ties and there's a a clear winner in each comparison. So for the results, you tally up the number of instances, each candy appears in the matrix, and the candy with the highest um, score is the top choice. So in this instance, we count them up. Um, Gummy Bears had three instances, so it's the top choice. Uh, Skittles came in second, Starburst uh, third, and Sour Patch Kids, womp womp, they came in fourth. So if you're thinking about this in the context of our call for projects and you say are comparing four roundabout projects, you're going to be looking at those projects. And you could, you could, if they've all scored eight points, you're going to be thinking about which of these is the most impactful. You could be weighing in on how impactful is, is this roundabout project in achieving equity objectives or uh, how effective is this roundabout um, do in terms of achieving the goals of neighborhood centers and urban corridors. So the, this is a way that you could apply ranked, or excuse me, pairwise comparison. Now for ranked choice voting, it's straightforward. You have the option to rank projects in order of your preference. So this, this would be done um, through a ballot. So each of you would receive a ballot and you would rank your first, second, third, and so forth choices. The votes that do not help 
the voters' top choices when counts for their next choice. So in this example, each of you would rank um, chocolate candy bars with nuts in orders of your preference. To determine uh, a single winner, a candy bar must receive more than half of all votes counted. So all first choices are counted. If a proposal obtains more than half the votes in the first round, that becomes the winner or the top choice. Um, if not, the proposal with the fewest voice is eliminated. And in the second round, the voters who rank their eliminated proposal as their number one will have their votes count for their next choice. So this continues until there's a majority proposal. This could also be done for ranking, but that ranking gets sorted out after um, one of the candidates or projects would uh, achieve more than 50% of the votes. So in this example, we're comparing Snickers, Almond Joy, and Mr. Good Bar. In round one results, no candy bar reaches that 50% or 10 vote threshold if there were 20 voters. So Snickers had the fewest votes and is dropped in the next round. So at the beginning of round two, the two Snickers voters, their second choices would be reallocated. So in this instance, um, uh, two, two votes are going to Almond Joy and three of those votes are going to Mr. Goodbar. So by the end of that round, um, two, Mr. Uh, Mr. Goodbar emerges as the winner because it exceeds that 50% threshold. So in this case, Mr. Goodbar would be the top choice, Almond Joy, the second priority, and Snickers would be the third ranking priority. Now, for a note on pairwise comparison on the staff, we think that this really could be executed in real time during a meeting where uh, policymakers would be afforded the opportunity to discuss the merits of the proposals and what they think are its strengths to, to share and deliberate on those with their with um, the board as a whole. And then you would go through and do that pairwise comparison in real time. As staff, we would be tallying those votes and presenting it to you. Perhaps with ranked choice voting, this could be best done as um, uh, before the meeting, where we would send out the ballots before you meet. Um, you would do an online survey to rank your choices and bring that back to us just to give us as staff um, a sense of where you stand and then present that information back to you um, at your November 9th meeting before you take any action. Um, so all three of these could be useful options, but today we're really looking for your discussion and action on what you see as um, the, the preferred ways of um, selecting and sorting through tied projects to inform your funding recommendation to the council. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to you for your discussion. Let me jump right in here. I, I do think the rank choice um, option seems to make the most sense. I think we're seeing rank choice uh, as the preferred option on a lot of different, um, you know, I for what I'm seeing in the political world, rank choices are being the preferred option um, because you know everyone's number two may may you know maybe the, the end up being the compromise between you know someone number one and number three and it just it just seems to make the most sense but i i will open it up to that's sort of where i sound I'm, i like the rank choice but let me i'll go with danny and then i'll go to Amy. yeah um i mean i think rank choice could be could be good uh the only thing that i would say is if we're doing those ballots in advance of the meeting I learned so much from the dialogue that we have as a policy board. And so if there's no opportunity for that, we're just, you know, doing our ranked choice voting and then coming in with yeah. that already determined, like somebody, you know, in terms of like the, the comparing the different options, um, you know, I'm really intrigued by the opportunity to hear from other people and learn from other people and, per, and perhaps be uh, persuaded to make a different choice. Yeah. 
but that could also happen with ranked choice voting. We just wouldn't come in with our votes already loaded. Yeah, I like that. I like that too. I, I'd like to do ranked choice after hearing from everyone as well. Uh, Amy? Yeah, I agree. The the ability to dialogue with the pairwise and pairwise, I don't think would be practical on a larger political scale, but for a small group like ours, I think it would yield the best uh, discussion and really hone in on what the group wants. So that would be my vote. Uh, and ranked choice would be fine too. Uh, I just think you'll have uh, more clarity with pairwise. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian? Yeah. I was looking at it and it looked like pairwise was almost the same as rank choice in the sense that you're pairing things up and then as you're moving through, the cream is rising to the top of what everybody comp, uh, is able to work on. Am, uh, am I missing something in reference to the pairwise? I, um, Brian, I would say that the outcomes uh, will help yield the results that you want, but the pairwise allows that head-to-head -head comparison and dialogue between each project. So it's it's a little slower process than just jumping and right in with the ballot and ranking your choices. Oh, okay. That, I, as I said, I was trying to find the clarity between the two, and I, with that explanation, I can see that now. Thank you. Pete, what do you think? Yeah, I, I like the ranked choice, but I have a practical question here is the, the Thurston uh, charter for the, for the overall TRPC has a different uh, way that if a consensus cannot be reached, uh, the way the voting has to um, be weighed, weighed by jurisdiction, there's actually a weighting factor, to, I believe, depending on population. Um, I understand this could constitute a recommendation from the policy board, but it is possible that the full uh, TRPC board could override this using that that voting. Uh, is that is that a correct understanding of, of this? Uh, it is, yes. And so this what we're proposing is the process TPB would use to make the recommendation. Um, but what what um, Pete is referring to is in the bylaws for council, it has a a weighting system for votes when there is disagreement and and we can't come to agreement. and and yes, it's based on, um, population, but the the intent would be that TPB makes that the recommendation based on this process, and that council would be able to to take this the simple majority vote. But you're right; if they could not, then that would um, go to their weighted um, uh, voting process that's in the council bylaws. And so, has there been any discussion of this at that level yet? Um, we did uh, discuss the this, and but the idea of the weighted voting did not come up in council's discussion. To my knowledge, that weighted voting has not been used before. It is in the bylaws, but I'm I'm not sure. At least in my time, and I've been told that uh, no one can really recall a time when that weighted voting process had been used. Yeah, I don't I don't recall it ever being used, no. but but it is out there. I just wanted to point that out. You're correct. Yeah. You're right. And because uh, we haven't ever come, I can't remember last time we come down to an actual tie um, where it would have to be used. Um, I, I do think it's really important either way um, that um, if there is a tie that that the policy board has an opportunity to hear you know, from the applicants and from other policy board members on, on where they where they're at on that before any decision is made, whether that be weighted uh, or comparison or ranked choice. I just uh, I've, I've seen ranked choice sort of become the popular um, option in other um, situations where uh, voting occurs. And so it seems to be, um, you know, it seems to be the more popular choice. But I, I totally agree that we have to hear on a case by case basis, um, you know, um, whether it's compared one project to every other project or the ranked choice, you know, we need to listen and, and, and hear from at the time. So 
I'm not sure if you have a good direction. Uh, where do you, are you looking for a vote now if, from us? If I if I could offer you an option, mm -hmm. um, we could provide a, a remote pre-meeting ranked choice ballot to kind of really survey as as a way to um, get get a, a preview of what the the board's sense is, and then we would present that to you at your November 9th meeting for you to reflect on that and inform a discussion um, around then a pairwise comparison and then conduct a pairwise comparison um, to, to break those ties where necessary. That's one option. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think what we'd be, I mean, so I think it would be good if we could take um, a bit of a straw poll on um, rank choice versus um, the the, the um, pairwise comparison. And and I think if if we end up with rank choice being the policy board's preferred option, I think we as staff we'll need to put our heads together about how hearing that then that policy board need, wants to have that ability to discuss the projects before they would do that voting. I think we, we need to give a little more thought to how we could, could make that happen. So today, what would be helpful is to, to know overall is the preference for that, that rank choice voting or the pairwise comparison. Well, and Andy, this is Pete. If I could offer an alternative here, I'm a little confused by the two alternatives that that Paul presented. Um, why not have one method? Uh, let's assume rank choice. Have a discussion, and then if people want to alter their rank choice uh, after that discussion, take another live poll at that point, and then go with those results. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so. And I think that could be, that's why I think we, we as staff hearing this, I, th I think we, we can put our heads together and, and give some thought to how we could make those things work. Cause you're absolutely right. That is one possibility. Yeah, I, that's, that's where I'm sort of thinking too, is maybe we have a preliminary, um, have some discussion and then do another quick rank choice. You could do it. In, in, we're talking about, I mean, the chances of there being a tie, you know, I don't know what the chances are here either, but. I imagine this is only going to come down to maybe a couple projects that tie up. So, um, you know, I don't think it should be a, a terribly long process after we reach the tie. So, um, Brian, do you have something to add? I was just going to say, I, I'd like to see the rank choice being done after a short discussion. Um, yeah, my concern with doing the rank choice before and then having a discussion and doing rank choice is which one's the official vote? And that's the thing is, when you're looking at something think, like that, which one's gonna be mentioned yeah. as the official one? I think it'd be that the last vote we take would be the official vote. Can we can we get some some consensus? So do we like to see, if we can figure out the rank choice um, way to do that? Can I, can people can see everyone's hands possible or a, an eye? Yes, rank choice, rank choice. Okay, uh, it's rank choice. So let's see if you can figure that. Okay, you can figure that out and, and bring it, bring it back to us. That okay. that's what we'll do. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, you. we'll that move. On, we'll move the school walking route map projects to next meeting. Um, with that, we've reached the end of our agenda. So, without objection, I will call this meeting adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Go Mariners. <laughs> you have a great day bye i was going to ask that question which is why i i brought that up before we well i'd it. like to hear the, your question peter so on sunday i was dropping off a kid at uh four tree lane and uh around the corner is a hilly trail the parents was complaining to me about drug use in that area